And what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about um, what we think the role of learning and memory processes and patterns of strengths and weaknesses might be in relation to the very uh, sort of variable language profiles that we find across the autism spectrum. Uh, and what I will do is I'll give uh, a brief overview of some basic uh, concepts in, in learning and memory theory, uh, then give you a whistle stop tour of some of the things we know about learning and memory in autism. Uh, and after that, consider uh, the possible role, sort of patterns of strengths and weaknesses might play in, in the language uh, difficulties that many autistic people have. Uh, and so to start with, I just wanna, uh, briefly mention that when I say learning, I usually refer to the process by which we acquire new skills or knowledge. So this could be learning how to ride a bicycle, learning how to uh, you know, say all the letters in the alphabet, learning how to walk and so on. Whereas memory is more the information that we acquire through learning processes and that we can store and retrieve uh, in different types of contexts. So if we think about uh, for example, sitting exams or doing tests or something like that, we would rely on our memory to sort of retrieve relevant answers and information. But this sort of distinction between learning and memory hides a lot of complexities that people have done a lot of research on. Uh, so if we think about learning as a process, we can distinguish between encoding, which is the way in which we get information into our memory systems, consolidation, which is again a process that sort of strengthens strengthens, or uh, if something goes wrong, potentially weakens the memory information that we store. And then we have retrieval processes, which are the processes by which we get information back out. Uh, and you'll see why it's relevant to think about different stages in the process as I go through the talk. Uh, but it's important to sort of realize that these uh, different processes, even though we often talk about them as if they were completely separate, they actually interact with one another. So every time that we uh, encode new information, for example, we actually tend to relate it to information that we already know. And therefore there's some form of retrieval involved when we learn new information. Uh, and likewise, every time we retrieve information, we might re-encode it. Um, uh, and therefore those processes are not independent. Uh, and these distinctions hide even more complexities because we can distinguish between different types of encoding processes, different types of consolidation processes, and also different types of retrieval processes. And I'm not going to go into any detail of that, but I just wanna highlight uh, that we can take a very fine grained view of different types of memory processes. And the same is true uh, when we think about memory or memory systems, uh, people have been distinguishing between various uh, sort of uh, dimensions of memory systems or, or, or various distinct systems such as short-term memory uh, and long-term memory and even within short-term memory you can distinguish between different processes that for example rely on different neural networks and so on and again i'll draw on some of the distinctions as i, as I take you through what what we currently know um, and so two distinction i really want to draw your attention to is that between short-term and long-term memory. So short-term memory is the kind of memory we use, for example, to hold a sequence of digits in mind uh, until we have a chance to write it down, for example, when somebody tells you your phone number or something like that. Whereas long-term memory is the, is, is the sort of the memory that we draw on when we try and remember what we did yesterday, uh, when we try and retrieve information about what the boiling point of water is or something like that. Um, and within long-term memory, I also want to just highlight the distinction between implicit memory, so uh, memory that we acquire without actually uh, trying to acquire it, so things that we learn automatically without a lot of conscious effort, uh, and explicit memory, which is the system that we rely on when we are uh, sort of consciously trying to retrieve memories, for example, or consciously trying to learn something. Uh, and within explicit memory, there's a further distinction between episodic memory, which is memory for our personal past, and semantic memory, which is uh, more decontextualized facts, such as the fact that you know that um, Rome is the capital of Italy, for example. Um, and you'll see why these distinctions are relevant in just a moment. So what do we know about learning and memory in autism? The first thing I'm going to highlight is that most of the things that I'm about to tell you stem from studies involving autistic individuals without very significant language or intellectual impairments. 
Uh, so this graph illustrates how many publications uh, there have been in each of a couple of uh, sort of year brackets uh, that mention the words autism and memory or autism and learning in blue. Uh, and those that mention those two terms in addition to language impairment and intellectual impairment or something like that. And so there's a very, very small proportion of studies that include individuals with significant language impairments and, and intellectual impairments. Uh, and you'll see why that's going to be relevant uh, a bit later on. But that's just something to bear in mind. So the first thing I want to say, drawing on this distinction between implicit and explicit memory, is that there is a general consensus that implicit memory is preserved and is an area of strength in autism. Uh, one way in which this is commonly measured is through tasks known as serial reaction time tasks, which is a, a bit like the whack-a-mole game, uh, where you have to respond to stimuli that appear, for example, in different locations or in different sequences. Now, in a whack-a-mole game, the, the sort of appearance of the thing that you're meant to hit is pretty random, and that's why it's very difficult to, to, to hit it uh, very quickly. In serial reaction time tasks, there is a, a pattern to the stimuli which might repeat a particular sequence, for example, of screen locations, and participants are asked to tap them as quickly as possible. And because they repeat, we get quicker and quicker and quicker at it without acquiring a lot of conscious awareness of the fact that there is a repetition on the screen. And in fact, in most of these tasks, uh, uh, researchers try and suppress the influence of explicit knowledge about a sequence by making the sequences very complicated and very long, but nevertheless implicitly we learn to get faster and faster and faster at responding. And across a number of studies, autistic participants demonstrate the same sort of learning rate as comparison groups, despite the fact that they might overall be a little bit slower. So in this figure here, you can see illustrated reaction times the darker black line illustrates reaction times of a comparison group, typically developing participants, uh, and in the gray line, autistic participants. And the key is that although they're overall a bit slower, the pattern of uh, getting quicker and quicker, so slow, having slower and slower reaction times, um, is, is very much similar in both groups. So implicit memory is generally preserved and an area of strength. In explicit memory, however, there is a particular pattern of weaknesses and some strengths. Uh, and I'm going to try and give you an illustration of each of these in just a moment. So first of all, uh, autistic individuals tend to have difficulties in the domain of short-term memory. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. They also tend to have difficulties uh, using meaning uh, to facilitate and organize their memories. Again, I'll give you some illustrations of that. Uh, and autistic people tend to have difficulties in episodic recollection, so in remembering the personally experienced past. By contrast, they tend to have no difficulties and often uh, actually perform better than comparison groups in what we call rote memory, which is memory for material that is less meaningful uh, in whatever way. Um, and they also tend to demonstrate strengths in, in semantic memory, so memory for facts that don't rely so much on remembering uh, yourself in the past in, in the sort of episodic sense. So let's take a look at some of these areas. So in terms of short-term memory, one of the most common ways of looking at that is through uh, things like digit span tasks or equivalents with non-verbal sorts of stimuli in which you present people with a list of maybe five, six, seven, or eight items, could be digits, could be words, could be locations on a screen that people have to tap. Um, and you ask them to, uh, to repeat those back to you. And basically what you find, uh, not surprisingly, is that the longer the sequence get, the more difficult it, it is to remember them in the correct order back, okay? And this is what's illustrated in these sort of curved uh, lines in, the, in these figures. Uh, so on the x-axis, you can see uh, how good we are at remembering uh, a particular word or digit or screen location within a long sequence in the correct position. Uh, and it gets more difficult within the middle of the sequence. It gets easier in the beginning and the uh, end of the sequence. The key is that autistic participants tend to perform worse uh, overall on these types of tasks. Uh, 
uh, which in you know in practice would would suggest that if you gave an autistic person a phone number to to try and hold in mind until they can write it down, they might find that more difficult uh, than uh, than non-autistic people, uh, and that has been replicated across quite a few studies. Now I want to say a little bit about the role of meaning. Um, I want to try and get you to experience that in, in a sense. And so for, for just a, a couple of seconds, I'm going to not say anything and just get you to read this list of words and then another list of words. And I'm going to try and get you to, to remember it as well as you can. Um, so read this and try and remember that. And here's another list. And again, just try and remember it. remember that. Okay, so in a little while I might ask you to try and write down as many of those words from the two lists as you can, uh, and we'll see whether whether this sort of little experiment demonstration might work. Uh, but here's another uh, example of where information might be organized more meaningfully or less meaningfully. So uh, in one case on the top you have a, a, a normal sentence, Harry played with his sister in the garden. Below you have the same words uh, randomly allocated in a bit of a jumble with garden and Harry, his the player sister. Um, Generally speaking, what you might expect is for people to remember uh, meaningful information uh, better than uh, sort of less meaningful information. And so now that I've talked for a while since you've tried to remember that list of words, if you want to, you could just try and write down as many of the two lists as you can on a piece of paper. So I'll give you 30 seconds or so to try and do that. Uh, which you will be given more time in a, in a real experiment. But again, I'll just stop talking for a minute so that you have a chance to try and write down as many of those words as you can. Okay. So you might have had a go, or you might have just waited for me to continue talking, either of which is fine. Uh, generally, what you would expect is that people remember uh, lists of words more easily that you can organize meaningfully around things like categories or something like that. So you might have noticed that one of the lists of words I showed you a moment ago included different exemplars of certain categories like fruits and animals. The other list had a jumble of words that weren't from the same sort of categories. And in any kind of memory test where you present material like this, meaningful information tends to be easier to retrieve than non-meaningful information, which is illustrated here. Uh, and across a number of studies, uh, we find that autistic participants tend not to demonstrate this sort of memory superiority effect for meaningful information. Um, What's important to note, though, is that their memory generally is uh, unimpaired. So it's not the case that memory for the non-meaningful material, for example, is worse, as you might find in amnesic syndrome syndromes, for example. There's something specific about using meaning to facilitate uh, memory. So yeah, just to illustrate that the non memory for non-meaningful information in this context is, is, is very similar. Now, I sort of put meaning in inverted comma for uh, over the past couple of slides because the concept of meaning might be different for different people. So the list uh, of words that I showed you earlier that included examples from different categories sort of assumes that you are uh, thinking about categories when you might be looking for words. You could also organize a list like that in a completely different way. You could sort of group together the shorter and the longer words, uh, depending on their syllables, or maybe ones that start with uh, letters that have a curve in it versus straight line or something like that. So you could come up with various different ways in which you organize the material that you're, that you're encountering in, in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and we actually wanted to look at that question in a bit more detail. Um, in a study uh, that I'll describe in just a moment, because we thought that autistic individuals may simply organize things differently. And when we present them with lists of words that have different categories, we shouldn't necessarily assume that the categories are very salient. There might be other things that are salient. Um, so if you think about uh, things like special interests and things like that, there might be uh, other things that are salient for autistic individuals that they use to organize material uh, that might not be the same for us. So we looked at this 
issue in a study um, a while ago in which we asked 16 autistic and 16 non-autistic adults to learn a list of 16 words over 16 different trials. Now the word the, the the number 16 was relevant for methodological reasons in this in this study uh, because it allowed us to ensure that on each of the 16 trials uh, the the 16 words were presented in a completely unique order that no word was preceded or succeeded by another word that was uh, seen also on a previous trial, and similarly we could ensure that each of the 16 participants saw a unique order of the stimuli uh, on each of the trials. And the reason why that was important was because that ensured essentially that the structure of the lists of words that people had to remember was completely unorganized. Nothing was repeated except for the words, but in terms of how they were ordered, uh, it, was completely, um, it was completely unorganized. Over the 16 trials, however, you can look at, first of all, how many words do people recall? And of course, because people see the same 16 words over and over, they remember more and more up until a point where they reach a bit of a plateau. And you can see in these line graphs that um, at the typical group of participants uh, sort of outperformed the autistic group a little bit uh, in this experiment. What was critical, though, is that it, the in this study, you can also quantify the amount of organization that people impose on the material as they retrieve it. So every time people are asked to write down or say as many of the words as they can remember, over the course of trials, they tend to become progressively more organized. In other words, the way in which they output the list becomes similar from one trial to the next. And you can quantify that um, uh, through a measure of subjective organization. Uh, and what was interesting was that um, we essentially found that both autistic and non-autistic groups demonstrated subjective organization um, as a group, and it was related to the amount of information they could retrieve. So the so more you organize the material, the more likely it is that you remember quite a lot of the words. What's in, what was interesting, though, and this is what's illustrated in this line graph, was that um, each autistic person tended to organize the list in a different and idiosyncratic way compared to all the other uh, the other 15 autistic uh, people in the group, whereas the typical group tended to become more similar as the experiment progressed. So in other words, there seemed to be a shared way across the typical group in which the material was organized uh, compared to the autistic group in which um, people tended to do their, their own organization on the basis of principles that we don't know exactly, but uh, but it was interesting to in relation to this question of what meaning is for different groups of people. Uh, and this sort of clearly suggested that meaning is not the same thing for, for, for everybody. So the final thing I want to just highlight about uh, sort of the memory profile in autism is that episodic memory or episodic retrieval tends to be a source of difficulty. So as I said before, um, uh, Episodic memory refers to remembering our personal past, uh, such as remembering exactly where you were at a particular time uh, and, and what happened then and in what context and so on. Um, and in memory paradigms, we can distinguish this kind of episodic retrieval from more semantic based retrieval, what we call knowing, through this uh, remember no paradigm in which you ask people to, to, to learn a list of words, for example, you then show them a list of words uh, that include some of the ones they've seen and some that they haven't seen. And you ask them, first of all, do you recognize it? Was it on the list? And they might say yes or no. And if they recognize it, you say, OK, do you clearly remember, uh, for example, what you thought about at the time or where it appeared in the list or something else about the context of when you studied it? Or does it simply seem familiar? Do you simply know that it was there, but you don't really know why you know that it was there? Um, in these types of tasks, recognition tasks, autistic and non-autistic participants tend to perform very similarly in terms of simply saying correctly that either they had seen a word before or that they hadn't seen a word before. And that's illustrated by uh, the, the, the sort of the line graph that you see here, so where there's very little group difference. However, when you break down responses into whether or not participants say that they clearly remember episodically, uh, what, what what the word was and where it was and how they remember it, um, 
autistic participants tend to report less of that remembering and a bit more of that knowing uh, compared to a comparison group. So this is one indication uh, of the fact that um, memory is less uh, episodic in, in the context of autism. And this, all, this has been demonstrated also in studies by Laura Crane from, from Cray, for example, who looked at episodic memory more in, in terms of autobiographical types of memories, asking people to uh, sort of remember details about uh, certain periods in their past, such as what the name of their primary school was or the name of their primary school teachers, so facts about the past that wouldn't necessarily be very episodic. And on that sort of knowledge base, there were little group differences between autistic and non-autistic people, as shown here on the left. Whereas when people were asked to recall very specific events about their past, maybe their first day of school or something like that, uh, autistic people tended to uh, report fewer details, such as the context, what they were maybe feeling at the time and so on. So across different types of, uh, of paradigms, we see this lesser degree of episodic retrieval, but in the context of very little group differences in terms of semantic retrieval uh, or knowing. So I want to just conclude this sort of whistle-stop tour uh, for a moment before I go on to the question of what any of this has to do with language. Uh, so just to recap, implicit serial order learning uh, tends to be a source of strength for autistic individuals, but explicit serial order memory tends to be a source of difficulty. Relating information and memory uh, to one another in terms uh, on the basis of meaning is different. Uh, it's not that meaning doesn't exist or doesn't have an effect on uh, on memory and autism. It seems to be more the case that the, the type of meaning that autistic individuals derive and use to organize their memory is different um, from, uh, from other individuals. Uh, so it's often very idiosyncratic. Uh, and finally, episodic retrieval is a source of difficulty. So this sort of episodic versus semantic distinction is very relevant. Now, what does any of this have to do with language? Let me just check how I'm doing for time. Okay. Um, so we know that the, um, the language profile in autism is, is very heterogeneous. And uh, whether it's uh, looking at comprehension or expressive aspects of language, looking at grammar or phonology, uh, there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that there are huge individual differences in autism. And of course, we know that a, a relatively large proportion of autistic individuals have uh, developmental delays in language and end up having sort of significant language impairments relative to their age. Um, what we don't know, though, is what the causes of that heterogeneity is. And uh, there's been quite a lot of theory about it in terms of whether it might be linked to theory of mind difficulties, whether language impairments in autism might uh, represent comorbid uh, sort of specific language impairment, because specific language impairment can exist outside of, of the context of autism, um, whether it might be linked to low, no, low nonverbal intelligence, differences in sensory perceptual processes, and so on. Uh, but nothing has been concluded, really, uh, partly because there isn't a great deal of research involving particularly those individuals with autism who have the most significant language impairments. Uh, what I want to consider for the, for the time that remains is what role this sort of pattern of memory strengths and weaknesses might play uh, in memory that I've just talked about. And if you'd like to know more about this topic, if you want me to send you any review papers, there are quite a few interesting ones that I can send on. Um, so first of all, let me just remind you again that we know very little uh, about this link between memory and learning uh, from studies that include individuals with very significant language impairment. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is think about how we can change that and how we can uh, sort of look more carefully uh, at, at the autistic spectrum as a whole in that sense. So sort of the generating studies and evidence uh, from studies that include individuals both with and without uh, significant language impairments. And that's challenging methodologically because uh, you don't wanna make a task too difficult or too easy for different groups of participants. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about these sort of methodological issues in just a moment. Um, but I wanna tell you about two sort of studies or projects that we've been working on um, that have tried to look at that. So the first uh, study, it was more sort of a, 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 a data mining opportunity to look at the relationship between 
short-term memory uh, or indices of short-term memory and aspects of language, particularly sort of vocabulary knowledge uh, and what I call here sort of semantic knowledge. So in our research group, we have a database uh, of adults with and without a diagnosis of autism who have participated in various experiments. And in that context, they often complete uh, the Wexler intelligence scale, which includes measures both of vocabulary knowledge and semantic knowledge, as well as measures of short-term memory in terms of one of these digit span tasks I showed you a moment ago. And so we have about 91 autistic adults uh, and about 98 uh, typically developing adults on this database, uh, very few of whom have very significant language impairments, I have to say right from the start, but nevertheless, their performance on these measures on the waist varies. Um, and what we were interested in is to see whether performance on the short-term memory um, exercises predict individual differences in vocabulary and similarities uh, subtests, which are measures of semantic knowledge. And what you can see on the table on the right hand side here is that that's basically confirmed. So in the autistic group, short term memory, memory indices significantly predict individual differences in performance on vocabulary and similarity subtests which measure people's vocabulary knowledge, basically. Uh, and the same was not true uh, for, the, uh, for the typical comparison group. Now, we looked at the same thing again in the context of data that we acquired from, uh, from a group of children, uh, again, in the context of a, of a larger study that I'll say a bit more in just a moment. But again, we had measures of um, uh, waste subtests, subtests, vocabulary and similarities that are these sort of measures of semantic knowledge. And we also had measures of uh, digit span from a different test, in this case, uh, a children's test of phonological processing. And we had two measures, memory for digits and memory and non-word repetition. Um, and again, just as with the adult data, we find that these measures of short-term memory predict uh, individual differences in vocabulary and similarities measures. So this, this was just an opportunity to explore this relationship uh, within some data that existed already. And it suggests that there's this link. Now, we wanted to look at this uh, again in more detail through a measure that would be appropriate for people with a range of language and possible intellectual disabilities. And so with the support of, um, of the British Academy, uh, we developed a task called the Bunny Task that we hoped would help us shed light on serial order learning and its relationship to language processes. And the task was set up uh, in a relatively simple way. We simply had, it was a bit like a whack-a-mole game, but we had a bunny that appeared out of um, uh, five out of a possible eight screen locations, rabbit holes, in a repeating sequence of locations. So the rabbit would simply pop out, stay there for a second, and then disappear again. And it was sort of a cartoon-like animation. And the only instructions we had for participants was to watch out for the bunny. And the task was an eye tracking task. So we had attached to the screen uh, a sort of a portable eye tracker that monitored basically where people were looking at and how quickly they were looking at the bunny. Um, and in a first sort of pilot experiment, we simply tested this paradigm with a group of uh, autistic and non-autistic adults who didn't have uh, any significant language or intellectual impairments, simply to see whether or not we would, we would demonstrate uh, learning, i.e. that people would start to look quicker and quicker at the location of the rabbit as the sequence re uh, repeated over and over again. Now, we were very surprised to find that uh, a, a typical, typically developing adults demonstrated a learning effect. So their gaze reaction times or how quickly they looked at the rabbit became progressively quicker as the, uh, as the locations repeated over and over again. And you can see that in the top graph as this sort of dotted line uh, moves down, people basically get quicker at looking at the rabbit, which appeared at this horizontal line of 1,000 milliseconds. Um, you can see actually that the this reaction time goes down to zero, essentially, which means that people look at the rabbit sometimes even before it appears in a location. In other words, people start to anticipate or look in anticipation at the, at the location where the rabbit is about to appear. And those anticipatory fixations, the number of them, is illustrated in the bottom graph where you can see that for the typically developing group, they increase, and for the autistic group, they, they didn't really. Um, that was quite surprising. We also looked at sort of individual differences in this paradigm. We actually found that uh, 
also in the typical group, most people or many people didn't demonstrate uh, or didn't yeah, didn't demonstrate learning in terms of these indices, but it was a, a group of individuals. So we changed the, the task a little bit in ways that I can explain uh, later uh, to make it more likely that uh, most participants would demonstrate some form of learning and maybe some quicker and some slower. So we repeated the experiment um, in a slightly different way with a fairly large group of autistic uh, participants, children in this case, and uh, some typically developing children. And critically, for the autistic group, uh, we recruited primarily from schools, special education and need schools, uh, that cater for kids with uh, complex needs, learning difficulties, significant language impairments. So 27 out of the this larger group, um, we could characterize as minimally verbal on the basis of the fact that we could not sort of administer language tests that uh, that you would typically be able to administer because we couldn't elicit relevant responses. So these were children who were yeah, yeah minimally verbal um, in terms of expressive language. And again, in terms of these, uh, the figures that you can see here, uh, we found these marked group differences whereby the typically developing children demonstrated learning, both in terms of a decrease in reaction time tasks um, and an increase in these anticipatory fixations, uh, which wasn't apparent in the, uh, in the autistic group. And what we wanted to do is look at the extent to which learning on this fairly implicit task might correlate with more explicit measures of serial order memory, such as the digit span tasks or the non-word repetition tasks, um, and, uh, to, to, and also how it might correlate with measures of vocabulary knowledge um, and, and things like that. So for all of the children that participated in this study, we had the same measures as I showed you earlier from the, from the WASI, so from the Wexler scale, as well as from these measures of short-term memory. Um, and we could we quantified learning in terms of the the slope of the decrease in reaction time for each participant. So we could, so for some participants who didn't show any learning, their sort of learning rate would basically be horizontal or zero, and for others they would demonstrate more more significant sort of learning rates across trials. Um, what we found, however, um, is that there was no relationship with any measure of language or with a measure of uh, short-term memory. But on the recommendation of a review of the paper, we looked at the, uh, at the relationship between learning rate and social communication quotient. So a measure, uh, a sort of um, the, the core clinical difficulties that autistic children have. And there we did find a relationship whereby the uh, children with the most pronounced clinical difficulties tended to demonstrate the, the lowest uh, learning rate on this particular task. Um, that wasn't something that we had set out to look at. It was something that we did when a reviewer recommended it. Uh, it's interesting, and um, maybe we can talk about that a bit later on. For now, I just want to focus on the fact that there was no relationship with the measures of language where we had anticipated to find some relationships. Um, and uh, that's interesting because it, it suggests that this bunny task does not um, tap the kind of serial order learning processes that we know from a lot of other evidence to be important uh, in relation to aspects of language, particularly sort of vocabulary learning and things like that. So uh, we don't know exactly why uh, this task is measuring something different, what exactly it is measuring. It's measuring clearly something because children uh, some children do demonstrate learning, but we're not tapping the process that we uh, that we set out to to tap, and that that's interesting in terms of methodology and how we might go about really tapping the processes that we might be most interested in. Um, the other sort of methodological issue that we uh, encountered in this task was that whilst we had set out to come up with a task that would be most likely to be suitable for a very heterogeneous group of children turned out still to be a, a source of difficulty for the children with the most significant language and intellectual impairments. So in the bottom uh, scatter plot here, what you can see is the relationship between children's verbal IQ as measured by the WACE and the proportion of rabbits that they actually fixated 
Uh, and that's sort of a measure of generally attending to the task uh, and generally kind of following the implicit task instructions that we had, which was to look out for this bunny. And what you can see in the shaded area, this is, uh, these are the children that we needed to exclude from the analysis because they fixated too few of the bunnies. In other words, they were not looking at the screen or at the things that we uh, needed them to look at uh, for us to derive meaningful data and analyses. And you can see that uh, in the horizontal sort of um, direction, their percentages are printed. And that's the percentage of children um, in the different IQ bands that we had to exclude. In other words, 0% of participants were excluded who had IQs between 130 and 160. Around 10 to 14% were excluded who had IQs in the range of 70 to 130. And children who had uh, IQs below 70, we ended up uh, not being able to process the data for about 54% of them. So even though this task in principle looks like one that could be suitable, it's still not good enough uh, in order to acquire uh, meaningful enough data from those children who have the most significant language impairments. Uh, and that's something that we're trying to sort of work on uh, in the future. Now, um, I'm coming nearly to the end. I want to tell you about one other experiment, a completely different type of experiment that tries to look at the relationship between aspects of memory and, uh, and, and language function and autism. Uh, and for this, I'm coming back to the distinction between episodic recollection and familiarity. Uh, generally speaking, the evidence suggests, the one that I showed you earlier, is that recollection is a, sort, is a source of difficulty for autistic individuals. But like I said earlier, most of the evidence so far comes from studies involving participants without language, uh, significant language impairments or intellectual impairments. Uh, what I call here ASDTL refers to autistic individuals with typical language, basically. Uh, Jill Boucher, however, has argued for quite a long time that perhaps in autism that is characterized by language impairments, so ASD language impairments, LI, uh, the declarative memory difficulties could be more pervasive and affect both episodic recollection and more semantic memory or familiarity. So her argument is, is that a more widespread uh, uh, difficulty in, in declarative memory that affects not only episodic memory, but also semantic memory could be the source of memory difficulties in autism. Um, and so the question becomes, how can we measure effectively recollection and familiarity in a way that doesn't rely on people telling you that they remember something or know something. So in a, in a sort of a more implicit, uh, implicit experimental way. Um, and Sophie Anz, a PhD student who worked with Joe Boucher and with me, developed um, a series of tasks to try and do that. And across both of these tasks, she included autistic individuals with language impairments, ASDLI, autistic individuals without language impairments, ASDTL, and a group of children with intellectual disabilities and a group of children with typically, uh, typically developing children, uh, and around 20 to 25 uh, sort of children in each group. Um, I won't go through this table in detail, but the, the, the way in which children were matched, it's quite a complicated sort of way of doing it. But the, the bottom line is that children uh, in different groups were matched on either chronological age or uh, verbal IQ but it was difficult to also match them on perceptual skills and that'll become relevant in just a moment. So uh, Sophie developed two experiments. One of them uh, is called the shape recognition and action recall task. Uh, it's a two phase experimental paradigm. And the first one, children are asked to remember or learn uh, different sort of random abstract shapes such as the one shown on the bottom left here. And then afterwards, they're asked to pick out that shape from a list of, uh, from a group of other shapes, basically. Um, and that's uh, a measure of familiarity. Uh, I can tell you about the reasons why it's a measure of familiarity later on, but for now, I'm gonna ask you to just trust me that it, it tends to be a measure of familiarity rather than recollection. Um, in a second experimental phase, uh, children were asked to, uh, again, sort of learn a series of shapes with associated actions that the uh, experiment sort of demonstrated and the child repeated. 
this task was set up in such a way that all children could learn to recognize the, um, the shapes. The emphasis here was on whether or not they could recollect the associated actions. And because it requires association between shapes and actions, um, it, it would tap recollection rather than familiarity. Um, in this, um, this paradigm, the four groups performed in such a way that the two uh, autistic groups uh, performed worse than the uh, comparison group, typically developing comparison group, um, but at about the level or better than the children with learning disabilities. Um, and this is where the sort of perceptual uh, skills of autistic children are worth bearing in mind, because it seems that because it's a, a task that requires remembering abstract shapes, strong perceptual skills are an advantage and can confer an advantage also on the memory paradigm, which is why uh, autistic uh, children tended to outperform the children with learning disabilities on this shape recognition part of the, uh, of the task, which you can see on the left-hand side here. Um, on action recall, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, particularly the children with um, autism and additional language impairments sort of performed uh, at the level of those with learning disabilities. Um, what's more interesting, though, was how performance on these two tasks correlated with measures of, again, semantic sort of knowledge. Um, and in this case, this is a very busy slide, I know. Um, in this case, we did find expected correlations between uh, the measure of familiarity and also recollection for the two uh, autistic groups, so shown on the top, uh, on the top um, two panels of this graph, you can see positive relationships. So the better you do on these memory tasks, the better you do on a language measure that taps this sort of semantic conceptual knowledge of language. Uh, in the typically developing groups, sorry, in the typically developing groups, we found this primarily for the children with intellectual disabilities, but not the typically developing children. And the reason why we didn't find it for the typically developing children is most likely because they, their performance was so good, there wasn't a lot of range uh, within which we could sort of gouge their, gouge their skills effectively. Um, so unlike in the bunny task, in this, in this sort of paradigm that distinguishes between familiarity and recollection, we do find that memory plays play, seems to play an important role. OK, I'm going to conclude here. I've realized that I've gone over quite a lot of material. Um, I hope I didn't go over it too quickly. Um, but let me just recap that, generally speaking, we know that in autism, implicit memory tends to be preserved. Explicit serial order memory tends to be a source of difficulty. That's relevant in relation to language, because we know that serial order learning plays a particularly important role in uh, sort of vocabulary ac acquisition early in life. Um, another source of difficulty uh, is, is a sort of an issue of relating memories on the basis of their meaning. And I think that needs further exploration. I haven't really said much about that in relation to language difficulties, but obviously meaning is an inherent property of language. Uh, and if there are differences in terms of how material is organized, that could manifest in, in, in various facets of the language difficulties we see in autism. And then we have this distinction between episodic retrieval and familiarity, recollection and knowing, um, where we do start to have some evidence that the, the, the weaknesses that we find uh, when we find them tend to be related to the language difficulties we, we also commonly find. Um, so there's starting to be some evidence, but there are methodological challenges still to overcome in terms of how we uh, how we sort of extend research to the group of people that have the most significant language impairments. So I'm going to stop here just to kind of acknowledge everybody who is involved in this work. So I've, I've talked about quite a lot. Uh, I haven't done nearly uh, much of it. A, a lot of the work is done by Derma Bola, Jill Boucher, especially also, and Sophie Anz, who's done uh, the, the work on this most recent stuff. Um, and I'm going to end here. Thank you so much, Seb. That was such an interesting talk and so clearly presented. Um, absolutely That's brilliant. That's good to hear. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we have had some great questions come through, so I'm going to try and ask as many as possible uh, with the last few minutes. Um, the first question from a couple of people actually asking about practical implications of the work. So one person asked, 
what implications might this research have for teaching autistic pupils when tasks or lessons involve the use of memory? How can we translate this into practice? And I'm going to ask the follow on question, which is very similar, which is, would you suggest any specific activities that might help autistic pupils learn vocabulary? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. And I think I have a pretty useful answer because Dermot Bowler and uh, uh, another former PhD student uh, have created a, a guide, basically, for teachers developed with teachers of an autism school um, that, that basically summarizes the kind of evidence that I've just gone through uh, and discusses the implications of it for educational settings uh, with uh, sort of suggested activities and suggested uh, scaffolds that, for example, teacher, for example, teachers might use uh, to support the areas of weaknesses, but also sort of take advantage of the many strengths. And I know that you you have sort of thought a lot about how to maximize on the on the on the strengths in the context of autism. Uh, and so, I the, the guide is freely av available. I can send a link uh, to you afterwards, so it can be circulated, and it's uh, it's hopefully useful. Um, and there are also some. Uh, so I've written a review with Dermot at some point about the educational implications. I can send that around as well. Uh, it's a, from a few years ago, but I don't think things have changed dramatically since then. That would be great. And um, we'll definitely, we can send around all these recommended um, documents uh, to all the attendees of the seminar. So that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, another question here that's come in asks, um, why do you think it's important to teach autistic children or adolescents serial order learning? From the perspective of neurodiversity, there might be some people who don't appreciate um, teaching autistic people something that's un unnatural in inverted commas to them. How would you respond to that sort of criticism? I don't think, I, I don't necessarily think that we would want to sort of force anything onto anyone that doesn't come naturally. Um, the question, I mean, at the moment, what we're trying to do is still understand why uh, some autistic children, uh, some autistic children's develop language development follows a, a, um, a fairly typical trajectory and why language development is delayed in others. Um, and sort of trying to understand the mechanisms that might be involved is important for, for simply understanding, you know, the huge uh, variability in, in language development, for example. Um, the other interesting sort of issue, though, is, is that the world is simply structured in a particular way around us and um, picking up on some of the regularities might be important for a language development uh, and it might uh, be in, important for other aspects of, of sort of interacting with the world. Uh, and so the question is whether or not uh, certain regularities in the world are simply not salient to some autistic individuals. Uh, and that making them more salient might not necessarily be a disadvantage or, or sort of compromise any of the areas of strengths, but could be simply something that uh, affords additional advantages without a cost. But of course, we don't know that until uh, we sort of ask the question and, and do all of the relevant research. So I don't think, you know, the, 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 the point of identifying um, areas of or patterns of strength and weakness and how they relate to some of the, the sort of the clinical characteristics of autism doesn't necessarily imply that we want to force anybody into a particular way of experiencing the world, but just exploring whether or not we can afford opportunities that might not be automatically available to people. Great, thank you. Um, the final questions are about future things. So one here uh, for someone who asks, what do you think future research should focus on to improve language or communication outcomes for autistic children? Well, I think the very first thing is that we need to find ways of representing autistic individuals with uh, more significant, well, with the most significant sort of language impairments, uh, sort of, uh, other areas of difficulty and things like that in research. I, I think it's very disappointing that with all the research that has been happening, uh, the vast majority of it includes individuals from uh, only one part of the autism spectrum. Uh, and the individuals with the most significant needs are significantly underrepresented. So I think the very first thing we need to do is, is, is address that sort of disparity. Um, and that's one of the things that 
uh, that we have been trying to do, basically think carefully about at a methodological level, how can we make research accessible uh, to, to the whole autism spectrum, basically. Um, and, and that will open the door to sort of identifying the sources or the correlates of the memory, uh, or sorry, of the, of the individual differences in language development. And that can hopefully inform how we might uh, scaffold language development if that's what we want to do. Um, the, I think what's promising is, is that the evidence that is starting to emerge highlights, um, highlights sort of relationships between, for example, aspects of memory and aspects of language that are not new or unique to autism necessarily. So there's a lot that we can learn from other areas of the literature, um, but there will also be other, other factors that, that play a role in language difficulties in autism that will be unique. And I think motor function is, is possibly one of them where, where we know very little about sort of um, speech motorics and how that might tie in with the motor difficulties that are not uncommon in autism. So there's lots to do. Um, yes. I'm going to ask one follow on question related to that. What are you guys doing next? What's next for your research in this area? Are there any hints that you um, can share at the moment? So we we are so so I recently uh, received a grant that you know of as well where, as part of a complex needs study group that Aut Autistica has set up, which uh, sort of tries to um, develop better and uh, yeah better methods basically of of recruiting autistic individuals with complex needs into research. Uh, and in that context, one of the things that we're going to try and do is build on. The, the sort of eye tracking work that I talked about in terms of developing further paradigms, um, but also looking beyond memory and language at things like, you know, sources of distress related behaviors, for example, or how that might tie in with sensory related difficulties and so on. Um, so I think my per personally also, I think the, the, the most important thing for the immediate future is to establish a very sound methodological base on which to build a proper research program. Uh, I think the reason why autistic people with um, the most significant needs are so underrepresented in research is because uh, because we don't have the right sort of tools available to do to do research properly, um, and and I think that's that's the thing that I'm hoping to to contribute to over the next couple of years.